So this is a 2008 Sunseeker Portofino 47, and it's a really quite good boat. In fact, it looks like it ticks all the options. But I'm going to do something a bit unusual today, and I'm going to tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I guarantee that I will teach you something new about this boat that you didn't know. In fact, there's at least two things that I'm going to teach you about this boat, which I think you'll find quite interesting. Now, before we start the video, I've got some housekeeping to do, which is I've got a new shirt, which I hope you like. I've got with a logo on it and on the back, you're not looking at my flip flops, are you? And lovely, don't, don't film my flip flops. And I've got my mic, but I've listened to what you've said and I've turned the volume or gain or whatever you call it on the thingy-majig down. So now you should better hear me without me blasting the speakers out of your TV. So let's go and have a look at this little peach. There's a third thing, which is the whole point of this video. I'm telling you how much it costs to run this Sunseeker for a year. So let's go and have a look. Okay, so when Sunseek brought this out in 2007, 2008, it was rare to have a high-low platform. In fact, all the competitors, Fairline Targa 47, Princess V48, etc., didn't have this high-low platform. So Sunseeker had a totally fantastic USP. And as you know, Everyone loves high-low platforms because they go down, you can swim on them, you can lift your boat up with them, they look good, you can show off in the yacht club and say, my boat's got a high-low platform, your one hasn't, and all the rest of it. But actually, as you know, nowadays, all boats have high-low platforms. But what you don't know is that they cut some corners to make this happen. And I'm going to show you what they are on board. So let's go and have a look. So we've got this 2008 model for sale for £280,000 and it's fitted with the Volvo D9 575s on shaft drive. As you can see, it's got a really nice cockpit. I'll show you that in a minute. It's got this lovely table which I can make disappear. You pull this cushion out here. You then lift this little flap up here. You then watch all your fingers and toes and you fling it down there and then you put it all back together. Da da, job done. It's also got a really nice sunbed, which I'm going to demonstrate for you. So you pull this like this. Now, if John Lewis, Sunseeker London, is watching, I know this is part of his favourite part. A boat show is to demonstrate how you relax on your Sunseeker with a GT, which we haven't got in Essex today. But as you can tell from my overweight, unfit body that's six foot, that actually it's quite a big sunbed. Look, my feet aren't even touching the rails, and I've got loads of room either side for a bevy of beauties, which we haven't got today unfortunately but it gives you an idea of what it could be like now we're in south end but can you imagine this boat in saint tropez with a cocktail pumping tunes and having a massive party wouldn't it be great look at it it's fantastic so let's go and have a look at the helm so here we have got a barbecue we've got an ice maker now ice makers on boats are awful and this one is no exception don't buy them if your salesman says do you want an ice maker fitted to your new boat say no go down the shop and buy a bag of ice for a pound one it tastes better two it's cheaper and three it never lets you down these always break right you've got a little this is for bottles of champagne and wine and 
protein flapjack. Is that you? <laughs> you can store whatever you want in there. Now, some people have been criticising me for talking, not, not talking enough about the dashboard. They say, I just say, well, look at all these gizmos and the compass. That's because, let's be honest, most of the dashboard is boring. All you want to know is steering wheel, forward, neutral, reverse. However, to keep those of you that are really interested in dashboards watching this channel, and subscribing, I'm gonna explain a little bit more about the dashboards. Because I do know a bit about them, believe it or not, but they're just boring. Okay, so you've got a plotter, which does your depths and speed. You've got your twin RPM gauges, one for each engine. Over, you've got obviously a set of dials here for the port engine, and the same set over there for the starboard. You've got um, the water temperature, you've got the volts, and you've got the oil. Um, you've also got the speed there, which I wouldn't rely on because they they don't work. It might look like it's working, but don't rely on it. That'll be better. You've also got a rudder helm indicator, which isn't on, but that is useful because um, when you're driving the boat, you'll know exactly where dead ahead is. This is your auto helm, which does your autopilot. Yes, the boat will steer itself. A VHF, which I don't really use, and you've got all the normal things like horn, which I don't think we've turned on today. You've got your music, and you've got another display here for other instruments. What you have got, though, which is interesting, is one of our very nifty little key fobs, which we accidentally made the wrong size. This should be twice as big. No one's noticed yet, have they? But if you drop this key in the water, there's no way that float is going to keep that key going. So, sorry if you've got one of these. We have got some bigger ones coming. Please send a stamp stress envelope and we'll send you another one. Also, can you just see under here, we've got a little footstep. So if you want to stand and look over this parapet here for the electric hard top, you can put that down the stand and shout out there. It's also got an electric window there for shouting, but I prefer a bigger area to shout from. And that's why you cannot beat this one here, because it's so big. Now, the other thing I was going to say is this boat has got a hard top. It's got a high low. It's got two cabins, two bathrooms. It seems to tick all the options, but it's got two little naughty secrets. And I think we'll, we'll tell you the first one in a second. So this is the saloon. And actually, if you think this is 2008, it's really quite cool. I'll tell you the things I like. The first thing I like is that it's got a pizza table. Here's how cool is that? Look at that pizza. I think that still looks nice. Really nice cabinetry, lovely seating. I also love the wood. This is walnut satin. Now in 2008, you didn't have walnut satin. Everyone had cherry gloss or they had Albert oak. But actually, walnut satin is what most people, well, most Brits now choose to have on their new boats. So to buy a 2008 boat with walnut satin is really, really good. You've got an updated TV. You've got a lovely galley area. You've got a little microwave in here. Got a fridge here, which is pretty small, to be honest, but... You've got, uh, you've got that cool box up there as well. You've got underfloor storage. Lovely, really nice, really, really nice galley. And I love all these details, these painted panels. Look at that round curve there. Um, it costs manufacturers more money to do curves. So if you see a straight edge, it's cheaper. A curve is more expensive. So at the bow, we have got the master cabin which again is a really nice size. You can see the headroom, look. It's got plenty of headroom. Um, it's got a TV in here as well, reading lights. Really nice finish. This is pure Sunseeker, this boat. And if you come in here, you've got Corian worktops, quite a modern sink, again, for the boat of its age. You've got um, walnut flooring. I'm not allowed to do any toilet jokes because I've been told off by the brothers. 
all the cabinets aligned beautifully. It's really, really nice. All for 280 grand. So where have they cut some corners then? Right, well, here's the first thing. At the same time this boat came out, I was selling Fairline Targa 47s and they were very high quality too. And on first appearances, they both look the same quality. But I happen to know that the floor under here is not GRP, it's wood. And there it is, it's marine ply. Now, you might say to me, what's the matter with marine ply? Well, nothing, but it's not as good as GRP because when this boat gets older and the boat's done a few hours, it could start to squeak a little bit and obviously wood can rot. This one's fine, but it was one of the things they did just to save a little bit of money. Sunseeker might tell you different, but having a GRP liner in here will last longer and be better. It's not a big deal and it might not bother you, but I just thought you'd like to know. And back here is the aft cabin. And the aft cabin has got twin beds. It's got a little window. It's all beautifully made. And it's got a bathroom. And it's that bathroom is just as nice as the bathroom at the bow. But this boat's only 47 feet. So how have they added a bathroom at the back, a high-low platform, a bedroom at the bow, well, I'll tell you what they did. And if we go into the saloon, I've got some bits and pieces that I prepared earlier to explain to you what they've done. Sunseeker put the boat on V drives. Now, for you, those of you that don't know what V drives are, oh, I'm going to do a little diagram using these 20 euro notes I found and these 50 p. But before I do that, I'm gonna shut that window because it's blowing all my money off the table. Okay, so this 20 euro note, still doing it. This 20 euro note is an engine and this is a shaft and this 50 p, is it? Is a propeller. So this is your boat here. You might be able to get this way, it would look better. That's the engine, the shaft, and the propeller. So on a Targa 47, you have engine, shaft, propeller. On the Sunseeker Portofino engine, shaft, shaft, propeller. Now the back of the boat, let's get this right. The back of the boat is about here. So the first thing you can tell is that the Sunseeker, they've managed to move the engine back by putting a V-drive in. The engine's turned around so the power comes out this way instead of that way, goes into a V-box and then back to here. Now again, you might say to me, James, I don't care. If Sunseeker moved the engine to the back of the boat and it's made more space for my aft cabin. You're right, it does make more space for the aft cabin, but it puts a lot of weight at the back of the boat. On the boat with the engine and midships, the engine is low and it's a more balanced boat. On the Sunseeker, the engine is, on, not all Sunseekers, just this particular one, the engine is at the back of the boat, which means that the bow of the boat is a bit lighter. Now there's nothing wrong with that, but some people prefer it to be a bit more balanced. And if you prefer it to be a bit more balanced, then this is the one to go for. I will show you, I will film some pictures of the V-Drive. It's very difficult because the, the space down there is very, very small. Um, but I'll show you how the V-Drive works in a moment. So that is a really big difference and no one talks about it. And you now know about it. So you are a Sunseeker Portofino 47 expert. So there's the shaft, that 
that's the V box. That's the front of the engine, as you can see. And there's, it goes down under the hull there. Very difficult to see. So, I nearly forgot the title of this video is how much does it cost to own and run this boat? Well, I'm gonna tell you. And if we get our act together, I'll put it on the screen at the same time. So there's about six variables that you've got to take into account when buying a boat. The first thing, apart from obviously buying it, which we'll come to at the end, the first thing is berthing. So in the UK, a boat this size would cost you about 12,000 pounds a year to berth the boat. The second thing you've got is insurance. To insure a boat like this is between two and three thousand pounds a year. They're pretty low risk. After that, you've got maintenance and servicing. I would say um, to get those Volvo D9s um, on the V drives serviced is about five thousand pounds per year. And I would allow about another five thousand pounds a year for polishing, anodes, upholstery tears all that kind of stuff so let's call maintenance 10 grand after maintenance and insurance and berthing you've then got fuel now this boat here has a 1320 liter fuel tank and it's got a 200 nautical mile range um, so it'll cost you about £1,500 to fill it up. At cruise speed, she's going to be doing about 150, 160 litres per hour for the pair of engines. So what's that at pounds a litre? So 150, 200 pounds an hour. But in that hour, you've done 22 nautical miles. So it's quite good. I mean, you know, not compared to cars and things i mean boats are inefficient but so would you if you were pushing 12 tons through the water at 22 knots um so you've got um, a cost there the average boater does say 50 hours a year so you've got five or six tanks worth of fuel there at 1500 pounds so what's that eight grand ish i mean i'm just don't don't split hairs and tell me my maths is slightly wrong it's about right these are just approximate costs then you've got finance now obviously you could just buy the boat for cash um, but most people put a deposit down and borrow some from the bank banks want about 30 percent deposit so this boat's 280,000 so let's say you put 80,000 down and you borrow 200 the £200,000 would cost you about £2,000 per month to, to borrow. And that's on a straight line repayment, 10 year repayment profile. So we don't do PCPs on boats like you can get in cars. You just borrow some money and you pay it down in a straight line. You can get balloons and stuff, but for the purposes of simplicity, two hundred grand in a straight line is about two grand a month. Um, by the way, how I remember that, because people always say, oh, how do you know these figures off the top of your head? It's not rocket science. Um, it costs you um, 10 pounds per thousand per month. So 200 grand equals two grand. Um, so that's obviously down to your personal circumstances. Now the hot potato, the hot potato is depreciation. Now, um, probably the most common question I get asked week in, week out is, oh, if I buy this boat off you, how much money is it going to be worth next year? And the last time I checked, I did not have clairvoyant um, qualifications. But if we look at the history of boats, and if you're buying a boat of this age, if you paid 280 for this boat, I would expect this boat in a year's time to still be worth 260 270 now it could be still 280 and it might even be 290 because you know in the last year or two with covid etc we've had some prices going up but 
if you work on about twenty thousand pounds on this particular model this does not apply to every model that is sold some of my better some are worse but this boat here I think you'd probably only do 20,000. I'm not belittling 20,000, but that's, I think, a reasonable amount um, to work on losing. So, what does it cost you to run? Well, I disregard the monthly costs of the finance because that's personal to you, and some people just write a check out, and other people want to finance. So that's down to your personal preference. I always like to talk about something called cash burn. Cash burn is the money you have to spend each year keeping this boat, assuming it doesn't lose any money and assuming you've sorted the finance costs out yourself. So the pure cash burn is the berth. You've got to pay that. That's 12 grand. The insurance, 3,000. So that's 15 grand. You've got to use it. You've got to use some fuel. So let's call that the 8,000 I said on 50 hours. So how much are we up to? 23, 15, 12 plus 3, 15 plus 8, 23. And then maintenance, which is 10. So that's 33. So the cost of running this boat for 12 months is about 33,000. Now I know a few of you are going to be clever dicks and you're going to say, oh, well, you haven't thought of this, and you haven't thought of that. But I'll tell you now, I'm not far out. So bank on about 33,000 as the cash burn. If you can't afford to lose or have the boat cost you 33,000 a year, in addition to all the other things you do, then this boat is too dear for you. And look at something cheaper. I can sell you boats that have got cash burn of very, very little, but they've got oars and they're not as fun as this. So that's the cash burn. You've got the finance figures. So all in all, you know what it costs now to own a Sunseeker. So in summary, Sunseeker ticked all the boxes with this boat. High-low platform, big electric sunroof, twin diesels, shaft drive, V-drive, you now know V-drive, two cabins, two heads. Looks fantastic, drives beautifully, although remember, it's got those engines a bit further back to give you, give you the accommodation. Um, slight compromises they're only small but i'm just being critical the engines are on v drives which moves them further back so it's a little bit nose light in my personal opinion but nothing to be worried about and just think about the wooden floor in the future if you're buying one of these have a look at that wooden floor and just check that it's not rotten or it hasn't moved and also the other thing i'd do is go out for a test run and just make sure it doesn't squeak like an old bed because um that floor could squeak if it's had a bit of a half, bit of a hard life. In terms of running costs, I've gone over all those with you. You can see it's not cheap to run, but it looks fantastic. It's a really, really nice boat. I can't recommend it enough. If you don't want the V drives, then go for a Targa 47 or a V48, which have got engines straight of this age, straight shaft drive but then you haven't got the high-low platform and you can't have everything. Can you uh, let me out? Honestly, <laughs> I'm not very good at these engine spaces. Get me out of here, it's so hot. <laughs>